Okay, it's two o'clock, so we will get started. Um, and before we start today, we do just have a, um, a report from the city clerk. And so it, city clerk, I'll just get you to review this um, before we start our meeting um, and get into the agenda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yeah, this is a little unorthodox, but Council is uh, required to pass a resolution at this point in order for, um, for us to be able to continue our meetings without public in attendance. And this is in order to comply with the new ministerial order uh, 192, which was issued on June 17th and provides further guidance to local governments um, regarding open meetings and electronic meetings with the intent to move local governments towards more normal operations. Um, so the new order requires uh, local governments to undertake best efforts to allow members of the public to attend open meetings in person, uh, while of course still abiding by public health requirements or recommendations under the Public Health Act. Um, local governments not able to apply with public health orders and hold in-person open meetings are required to adopt a resolution to provide a rationale for the continued need to meet without the um, public present. So we are working towards having in-person meetings. Uh, we're targeting uh, September to be able to do that. And we're, we're looking at um, suitable options to do that. Uh, so in the meantime, we're going to continue as we have been and continue to provide every effort to the public to participate in our meetings electronically. And therefore the, the resolution before you will enable us to continue our meeting today without public present. Thank you. Council, before we read the motions, are there any questions on that? Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So this means like in September, we end up having to meet like at Glenwood Center or Capitol Theatre or something like that. Is that what the intent would be? Uh, that's correct, Madam Mayor. That's uh, we're we're looking at a number of of locations. Um, ideally, I think um, we're going to be targeting the Capitol Theatre for a number of reasons. Uh, we have identified our own facilities as well, and we we've, we've been looking at those. But um, those those other facilities are certainly bigger than council chambers, and would require, um, or would allow for the physical distancing that uh, that we need to do. Thank you. And City Clerk, would you like this whole, um, uh, the, the motion read out including the whereas clauses, or is it okay for just to uh, someone to move it just as written? Um, I think uh, the resolution uh, as written, Madam Mayor, would be sufficient, um, and it does cover off all the, the criteria we require to satisfy the order. Great. Thank you. Would somebody like to make the motion as written then? So moved. Moved by Councillor Corbeil, second. second by Councillor Tholda. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. Okay, and we will now get into our agenda and just recognize that we are conducting our meeting on the unceded territories of the Sashat and Hoopachesset First Nations. We do have a, an agenda in front of us. Are there any late items from councillors? Seeing none, any late items from staff? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, just one. Uh, it'll be under F3 and it's correspondence related to the development variance permit. Great, thank you. And, and just a reminder to everybody that we are um, video recording and live streaming. And of course, if the members of the public would like to submit um, questions for question period at the end of our meeting or input for public input period. Um, the email address, I believe, is council at portalburney.ca um, and the clerk is not disagreeing with me. So if there's any correspondence for people or comments for people to send in, you're welcome to email during our meeting and that will be checked um, for question period at the end. So with that, would somebody like to move approval of our agenda as amended with the late item? So moved. Councillor Solda, seconded by Councillor Poon. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. And we have minutes from the special meeting of council held at 10.30 a.m. and the regular meeting of council held at 2 p.m. on June 22nd. Would somebody like to move adoption? So moved, Madam Mayor. Moved by Councillor Corbeil. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. Any comments or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? Carried, thank you. 
And we that takes us to public input period. Um, City Clerk, did we have any input received? We have not, Madam Mayor. Okay, thank you. And on to delegations. Um, and the first delegation we have is from um, the Rotary Community or is for the Rotary Community Mur Mural Project, um, building relationships brick by brick. And we have a presentation um, just to update us on this project. So looking forward to hearing about this um, and it's, it's an exciting project going on in the community. And I see Terry Deacon popping up. So Terry, I will pass it over to you. Oh, and I think you're muted, Terry. There we go. Now we can hear you. Welcome. All right. Perfect. Thank you to Mayor and Council for hearing me today. Um, and my name, like Shari said, is Terry Deacon. And today I am in my role as the Mural Project Committee Chair for the Port Alberni Aerosmith Rotary, also known as the Morning Club. And I will acknowledge that we are conducting business on the uh, traditional territories of the Sushot and the Hoopachesset and thank them for that. And um, I have a presentation. Um, do I need to share my, oh, I need to share my screen now. If you can, Terry, yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, slideshow. Okay, so like I said, it's a community project um, sponsored by the Port Alberni Aerosmith Rotary Club. And we do have some partners that I'll talk about. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the project. So it came as an idea when Teresa Kingston was on the Reconciliation Committee, and it might have been as old as, uh, as long ago as, as late 2017. And uh, then it, we generated the idea and talked about it in the club. We applied for a community investment program grant in 2018, and were successful. Uh, we got our community partnerships on board. So we uh, are working with the Port Alberni Port Authority because they own the building that where we want to put the mural. Um, we got the city on board, a Canadian Maritime Engineering who is the, the um, tenants in the building and the Sushot First Nations. And um, we also at that time applied for a Rotary District grant, um, which is in American funds, it's $3,500. And we were successful in getting that. Um, and then we put out our call for artists. And when we had response from two different parties, and they were both well over the amount that we could afford at that time. So we had to put the proposal or the project on hold. And um, at that time, then the committee got together and did select Shane Lloyd as the successful proponent. Um, but we had to do a lot of revisions. So it was kind of put on hold and I wasn't gonna let it die. And I thought I, we have to go forward with this project. And I think especially right now, it's really timely with all the um, unrest and all the racism and everything that's going on in our world today. I thought it's a really timely for our project. So we tried to revisit the costs and um, I have a, a slide here with the anticipated costs. Uh, on the right hand side of the, the um, Excel sheet. And um, it came to about $50,000. And so we were still short money and, and we needed to do a fundraiser, but our hops festival was canceled and um, our typical fundraising events weren't able to happen. So we've had to reinvent some, some fundraising so the Rotary Club itself has $13,000. Our CIP grants um, amount to 4,000. And with our Rotary District grant, which we've had to reapply for, but we anticipate that we will get it. And 3,500 American uh, makes almost, actually just over 4,500 Canadian right now. Um, and then I'll talk about our fundraising in a minute. And so the costs on the right hand side, um, we have been successful in getting some of those costs down. So 
and um, I'll also talk about that as we move forward. But you could see it, it was equal to about $50,000. And that's paying the um, artists, it's paying the collaborative artists, which are, are Tim Paul and Gordon Dick, and insurance and all sorts of things that we hadn't considered at the beginning. So here's a picture of what the, uh, a draft of what the mural is going to look like. It will be color. Uh, we don't have the color rendition of it yet. Um, and so on the left hand side is the traditional wolf ceremony of the Sashat, um, which was typically done down at the Harbor Key. And um, there are going to be dancers on the right hand side. The drums are going to have faces of uh, historical leaders from the uh, Nucholith people. So um, it's gonna be a really beautiful, beautiful mural and I, I can't wait to see it then. Um, and so our fundraising, we had to rethink our fundraising. So we decided that, see if you can see behind Gord Johns and myself there is a whole bunch of bricks. So there's 1,491 bricks that are gonna be painted. So we thought if we could sell bricks and so every person that purchased one would have a little piece of the building. So, or a little piece of the mural. So that's kind of what we've initiated and that's what we're asking city council to support. Um, to bring awareness to the project, bring it, bring it out there um, and purchase bricks. And so I have permission from Gord Johns and, and our MLA Scott Fraser to issue a challenge to all elected uh, representatives it, in that they each purchase four bricks, so $100 each, and, and they're issuing that challenge out to all other elected officials, and they're taking it out to their networks also and promoting it for us. And um, it, we have posters available, we have purchase orders available, we have, and I think everything was included in the package that I sent to Davina. Um, there's a, a copy of our purchase order, and um, to date we've sold about 92 bricks. It might be a little bit more now, now that, um, because this was last week that I did this, and I know people have been selling hot and heavy, and um, if we, so we've been successful in, in getting the paint and the equipment donated from Beaver Creek Home Center and their paint supplier, which is huge for us. And we've also, uh, with thanks to the support of Tim Pye, have been able to get an okay for the road closure so that we have, um, don't have that cost for the flagging costs. So that's gonna take almost $13,000 off of our costs. And um, then that's 520 less bricks that we need to sell. So we have just about 500, 600 maybe that we need to sell to actually get the painting done. Um, the painting will be starting on August 3rd and uh, hopefully be done at the last week of August. Uh, the, the road closure will be Monday through Friday, dawn till noon and um, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. at night. And um, so like I said, what, what we're asking of City Council is for you to promote our project, to purchase some bricks, and we want to thank all of our community partners and a special thanks to Tim Ply and Alicia Pusep and Willa Thorpe from the city staff who have been really helpful in, in helping us get this coordinated and, and put out there. And um, then I'll take qu questions if anybody has any. Thank you, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first of all, I'm really excited about this project, Terry. Thank you so much for taking this on and thank you to the Rotary Group as well. Uh, I do have a question though. Um, for, for closing the Harbor Road to the trucks, I know an alternative truck route has been proposed and they seem to be acceptable for it, but have you contacted the business along the alternative truck route just to let them know that this will be happening? 
We haven't yet, and that did come up um, when I was talking to, to Tim about it, and we will do that for sure. I'll actually, I'll make a note and get somebody from the Rotary Club to just go knock on doors and let them know. That would be excellent, just to let them know that this is happening. I'm, I'm sure everybody would be on board, but when they start noticing trucks going down in front, they might wonder what's going on. So I would appreciate that. Thanks so much. You're right. Thanks, Deb. Thank you, Councillor Poon. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to say very exciting project and I'm happy to support this project and uh, you can put me down for four bricks. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. And um, I, like I said, the purchase orders have been sent uh, to Davina, so she has them or in contact anybody from Rotary. We have the purchase orders and you can even do it online and submit payment online. So through e-transfer. Great, I have Councillor Solda and then Councillor Paulson. Yeah, Terry, I think it's a great project for the Arts District and I'm looking forward to seeing the completion. But I do have a question. Um, I love murals, so the thing is, um, there has been discussion about maintaining the murals after a while they fade. So what is your um, long term plan regarding the mural? Great question. Thanks, Cindy. We've um, we've looked into a finishing product that will last between five and 10 years, depending on on the exposure that the wall gets. And we know that that exposure that wall gets quite a bit of exposure. Um, so it will probably after five to seven years need to be refinished and we're working with the Port Authority to make sure that that does happen. Thank you, Councillor Paulson. Terry, just thought maybe um, you could just reiterate um, how you can do the purchasing and if you want to do it in person. Um, is there a kind of a central um, uh, drop off or central person that we can go and see to give them some money? <laughs> yes, uh, thank you for asking that. We do, um, you can come to any employment services anytime. Our door is currently locked to the public by a knock on the door or send me a text and um, our door is always open. So. Uh, you can come to Ineo, Swale Rock, you can go Monday to Friday, 12 to 2 p.m., even though Swale Rock is not open, but um, there is somebody there who is taking money and, to, and um, having the purchase orders available. And you can also do the purchase order online through our Facebook page, the Aerosmith Rotary Facebook page. And you can fill out the form electronically and you can send e-transfer, you can, the Scotia Bank is collecting the forms and money for us. And the city has also offered to use their drop box outside. So uh, people can drop checks off there and the form. And we also have an email, which is aerosmithrotaryclub at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for our staff. Um, I think that this is an excellent time to be doing this project. And a few years ago, we allocated, I think $3,500 was the amount um, to a different arts project in the, in the arts district area. And that was for artistic crosswalks. And that project never ended up happening, but we did commit the funds through our budget. Um, I think it was 2017 or 2018. And I'm just wondering if those funds are still set aside. Um, I think usually they do just remain set aside until you know something else is done with them. Um, I just thought this might be an opportunity to reallocate those funds to help get this project done. So it might be something um, just to, for us to look into, Tim. I'm not sure if you have that answer now. No, Madam Mayor, I don't have the answer at the tip of my fingers, but uh, we'll look into that. And I believe that was Rotary as well. Yes, I think it was a combination of, uh, yeah, Rotary yeah, and the Arts District. Yes, for sure. So um, so I know that project didn't happen. So I just thought that um, it might be might be a good fit here to use those funds for that as well. We'll look into it, Madam Mayor, and then we'll touch base with the proponent and see if that's still a project they want to complete. Great, thank you. 
Okay, well, Terry, thank you so much for coming and for the work that you guys are doing on this project. It's exciting to see it coming together. Um, and I will commit to BRICS as well. So um, thanks for providing um, you know, a variety of way for, ways for people to, to contribute and, and purchase. So thanks again. And um, I think that's it. So we will thank you for being here and move on to our next delegation. Thanks for hearing me. Okay, for our next delegation, we have CIRMAC and CME. Um, so Amy Johnson in attendance, oh, sorry, um, we have Eric Jensen, a Regional Production Manager and Brock Thompson, um, Innovation Director um, in attendance to um, provide information regarding a semi-closed containment system. Welcome. Okay, I think you're both muted right now. Sorry, uh, this is Amy Johnson with me today. Thank you for having us. Um, with me today is our area production manager, Eric Jensen, and our director of innovation, Brock Thompson, and they're gonna be walking you through the presentation. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And once that's up, I will hand it over to Eric. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Is that working? Are you seeing my screen? Yeah, sure am. Okay. There okay. we go. A couple of clicks over. Yeah, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Eric Jensen. I'm the regional production manager over on the West Coast over in Tofino. I think I might have uh, seen you guys a couple of years ago face to face. I came and sat in on one of our uh, one of your council meetings in an evening a couple of years ago. Uh, but anyways, just a little um, little overview on, on CIRMAC Canada. We're a salmon producing company here on the west coast of Canada. Um, we operate around uh, Vancouver Island. We have offices in Campbell River, which is our head office for CIRMAC Canada. And then we also have offices over in Tofino, where I'm at, and um, sales office over in Richmond. Um, we have uh, warehouse locations in both Port McNeil in our northern operation and uh, Campbell River and also a shipping and receiving building over in Tofino. Uh, we have, yeah, 26 marine licenses, um, all kind of scattered around the west and east coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, we have four hatcheries uh, located uh, closest communities would be Port Alberni, Campbell River, Courtney and Duncan. Uh, we have one processing plant, uh, CERMAC Canada Processing, and that's over in uh, my operations in Tofino. And we also have a long-standing relationship with a contractor on the inside of the island, um, which is Browns Bay, north of Campbell River. Um, depending on kind of the season and time of year, we're, you know, hovering around the 250 to 300 employees. Uh, really kind of all hinges around processing for us over in Tofino. And a couple of quick facts um, for um, uh, for you guys is, you know, being um, operating in uh, the West Coast local communities here. Um, we do have a large amount of money um, going into these communities at 625 million uh, that has gone in locally to contractors, supplies and services. Uh, that was based on some 2018 data. And um, lastly, um, yeah, we're annually, we're approximately the 22,000 metric ton uh, producing salmon company annually. So I'll pass over, we got some exciting stuff going on for us and that's why we're here today. And I'll pass over uh, the mic to our innovation director, uh, Brock Thompson. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, we're, we're in the process of um, working on delivering a semi-closed cage system to our Tofino area. So what you see in front of you is a, a picture of our installation um, at our horse bogging site in uh, northern Norway. Um, what uh, we plan on producing is um, something that would look very much the same as this. Um, so as you can see, it, it looks um, a little bit different than the traditional round cages that you see in behind it. Um, and you can kind of see a, a bag um, and some, some different equipment on it that uh, is related to the closed cage. Uh, so I'll get into the, a little bit more of the details. Uh, Amy, if you want to advance us one. 
Um, so this is what the, the semi-closed cage uh, looks like. It's got uh, a few significant um, components to it that uh, provide um, um, structure and function to the closed cage. Uh, first off, it's a 120 meter circumference floater. This is made out of um, thick walled steel pipe. The steel pipe is 1.2 meters in diameter, so it's fairly large pipe. Um, it then that suspends a um, high density uh, poly tarp bag that uh, is the, the physical barrier, but it also has a net installed inside. So it's got a bit of a secondary containment. Um, to provide water into the closed cage, um, it takes water from four different riser pipes at a depth of 20 to 27 meters. Um, that number is not arbitrary. There's a lot of work that's gone into determining that, that intake depth, and that's some of the design process um, that has gone uh, or been undertaken over the last um, 18 or 12 to 18 months um, at spe uh, specific farm sites uh, where we would like to uh, introduce this technology. Um, to provide water into the system, it requires four 35 kilowatt pumps, um, delivering over 300 cubic meters of water per minute. So based on that, um, the, the bag itself is 15,000 cubic meters. So it takes about 50 minutes for the uh, water to be turned over completely inside the closed cage. Um, to manage the cage, it's much like a, a hatchery at that point. Um, you know, there's sensors inside the, the cage to monitor the environment, O2, pH, salinity, turbidity, and, and water level. So the reason it has water level is because in order to maintain the rigidity in the bag, we actually have to have the water level inside the closed cage higher than the natural sea level. Uh, and that provides positive pressure on the bag so it won't deflect in the tide. And it, and it stays fairly tight, a little bit like a balloon. Um, and then, you know, to, to monitor the fish during feeding and, and normal activity, we have above and, and below water cameras. Now, as I mentioned, this is a little bit like a, uh, a hatchery setting floating in the ocean. Um, we need to, to maintain O2 levels. So we've got biomass in there, you know, we're supplementing fresh water in there, but we still need to maintain O2 levels and, and power the pumps. So we require a support barge to go along with this that houses all this equipment. And in there is a sophisticated electrical um, control cabinet that um, takes all the, the monitoring inputs um, and allows for automated control, surveillance of, of um, what's happening with each individual aspect of the closed cage um, and um, provides uh, the operators alarms and um, the opportunity to address alarms if they do arise. Okay, Amy, advance one more. So it, it's it's a it's a completely uh, um, new to us installation, but it def definitely has some demonstrated advantages. Um, and some of those advantages are the the ability to customize this. As I mentioned uh, when describing the intake pipes, um, we took 12 to 18 months of data from the farm sites that we were interested in introducing this to determine the level at which we wanted to draw the water. So we looked at um, water characteristics such as dissolved oxygen. We looked at salinity. We looked at really all the, the, the important chemical and, and um, biophysical uh, characteristics of the water column to get kind of the, the best spot for those intakes to be at. Um, and because we've got, um, we're essentially at the, the mercy of mother nature a lot um, in our traditional closed cages. This gives us a lot the ability to, to control the environment quite a bit more. So as I mentioned, those intakes are strategically placed. Well, now we can look at further eliminating things like harmful algae, uh, sea lice, and um, other uh, insults into the um, system by strategically managing the, the water intake. Um, of course, being semi-closed with that physical barrier, there's less likelihood for interaction between wild and farm populations. Um, you know, if we don't get sea lice into the system, there won't be sea lice coming out of the system. It's also adaptable. Um, the one thing about um, moving into alternative technologies is a lot of times it moves us away from the areas that we've traditionally operated. This doesn't, this allows us to continue to operate in the communities that we've, um, already are set up in and it is an alternative to 
or a, a supplement to what we already do. So it supports the operations where we operate as well as it supports the, the traditional farming. And overall, we've seen the improved fish performance that we would like to see with, you know, especially with regards to animal welfare um, and sea lice management. But there's still questions to be answered. There's still things that we need to learn about. Um, we've had success elsewhere, but we need to determine whether or not we can replicate that same success uh, in BC waters. So, you know, through the trial process, you know, we're going to be looking at the overall benefits um, and, and really establishing a clearer picture on the effectiveness of minimizing these interactions. And, you know, those will be measured by looking at, you know, the, the plankton inside the bag. We'll be still monitoring the sea lice numbers um, and um, obviously managing the, the animal welfare aspects as best we can and monitoring those to really understand what the potential is for the, the um, technology and well, as well as being able to then um, use that information to really establish um, the impact on the, the environment. Dissolved oxygen levels, oxygenating seawater is still um, something that uh, we're learning a lot about. Um, and then with this system, we still need to learn a little bit about, you know, how much oxygen we need to supplement. And that will then kind of help us determine the amount of biomass that we can support using this technology. So that'll be a major part of what we're doing um, over the next um, two years, essentially. And then, you know, we want to essentially deliver on the develop or the benefits that the system has um, to support the traditional farming systems. Um, and uh, it is costly, so we need to make sure that we can deliver on on the benefits to help support. Uh, fish performance as well as um, deliver on some of the uh, ecological objectives that we've set out to achieve. Next one. So um, results from, from Norway. So as I showed uh, earlier in the picture, this is just a different view of the same, same cage. Um, that cage in Norway is the same circumference, but it's actually a smaller um, bag. So we're, we're increasing the size to support the operations here in the uh, Tofino region. The intake depths at 15 meters in Norway. Norway doesn't have the same challenges as, as we do with regards to harmful plankton and some of the other insults. So they determined 15 meters was best because what they're trying to avoid is cold water. So at 15 meters, they had a, a better temperature profile for optimal growth in fish. Um, obviously based on the size, that 15 minute water retention is, is kind of what they wanted to achieve. So they had smaller pumps. Uh, but we have had good success through two cohorts of fish through the system. So the first group of fish went in in 2018, 2019. Uh, we stocked about 170,000 smolts um, in the fall of 2018 into the closed cage. In comparison to the control cages around, we saw 14% higher um, growth. Um, so 14% more weight at the end of the, uh, the trial period. Um, they had comparable uh, feed conversion ratio, so they grew faster with uh, similar inputs. Um, they had little to no sea lice, so no intervention needed for sea lice management. And overall, the fish welfare was similar or better to that of um, the control cages. And in fact, the mortality was lower in the, in the closed cage. The second cycle went in in the fall of 2019, um, and we uh, a little over doubled the number of fish. So we went with 400,000 smolt that uh, year class. Saw a very similar um, biological performance with regards to um, growth. We actually saw 20% increased growth uh, over the first 10 weeks. Um, and then no sea lice treatments required um, at all, while the control cages had uh, two sea lice treatments um, happen. And again, monitoring the, the fish welfare, there was uh, um, no impact on overall welfare with low mortality when compared to the control cages. So they've been able to replicate the results. So we feel strongly that we'll be able to, you know, take this information, take this concept and build upon these results. So moving on then, Amy. So in terms of the assembly process, um, it's already underway. Um, we've partnered with um, uh, CME, Port Alberni, um, to get this uh, all built. So it's uh, currently being um, um, assembled in the uh, Canal Beach 
lay down area and um, down the inlet. So it's uh, expected to take eight to 10 weeks of welding um, to get just the, the floating um, steel ring completed. The rest of the assembly happens out on site. So um, as we're using CME, we've got, you know, local contractors, suppliers and services um, used throughout all of this. And, and uh, it'll be supported by the um, same or similar service providers in Tofino um, upon delivery there. So as I mentioned, this, is, this has been a, a considerable process. Um, the environmental monitoring to kind of determine the um, intake depths as well as the size of the bag that we needed to best support um, the, the farming in Tofino um, has taken us uh, uh, close to three years. Um, so it started in 2017 and, and we finally came to uh, uh, an agreement on what the cage would look like uh, in the spring of 2020. Um, we've now taken delivery of the major components and assembly started now um, in uh, the summer and we will plan to transport everything to site kind of late October or sorry late August early September um, into the Tofino area and finally have everything ready uh, and commissioned by November to uh, input fish and then it's uh, about 18 to 21 months um, before fish will be um, harvested through the uh, closed cage. So that's when we'll be able to confidently determine the, the advantages, advantages of the technology in the area. So then Amy, we can move to the next one and show a few pictures of the assembly. So as I mentioned, it's, it's pretty sizable gear. So here's um, three pictures taken uh, last week um, of the assembly location. Um, so on the left, we've got an aerial view. So we're taking some drone footage as we uh, construct this. Um, you know, so we've got crane operators and crane trucks required to kind of position everything for the, the welders. Um, you know, on the, the middle lower picture, we can see one of the welders kind of getting ready to um, prep for one of the, the large welds. So you can see that um, pipe for the intake water is fairly sizable. It's, it's, uh, um, no small piece of equipment. And then on the uh, far right, uh, we can see one of the sections being uh, positioned and lifted by the crate. So it's a pretty impressive piece of equipment and a pretty exciting uh, little venture for us. Um, and we're fairly confident that it'll um, be a great addition to support our operations um, on the West Coast and, and hopefully in the future of the East Coast of Vancouver Island as well. Great. Okay. Sorry, I'm just unmuting myself. Council, are there questions? Start with um, Councillor Paulson and then Washington. Um, <clears throat> it's a great, um, great concept, and I think um, hopefully it'll alleviate. Um, a lot of concerns over the past few years with regards to intermingling with uh, natural stocks and, and farm stocks. Just a couple of questions. Um, have you presented um, to the Ahouset and uh, what's their response to this new project? And I wonder if you could just for myself comment a little bit on um, your operation. And we've read a bit on um, on uh, land-based operations and, and kind of the differences and I'm sure land-based is more expensive, but um, just a couple of things, um, the First Nations support out, out in your area and um, maybe you could educate the uneducated here on, um, on ocean farms as opposed to um, land-based farms. Okay, so uh, first off to, to uh, um, answer the how's it question. Um, yes, we've got a, a, a strong relationship with um, uh, the how's it First Nations and, and we uh, approached them about um, this project um, prior to and got their uh, endorsement um, before kind of moving ahead with it. So um, they're supporters of, of us moving in a, in a direction to improve um, the 
operations within Tofino, um, especially with res with regards to the protection of wild fish. And this is a good fit for both CIRMAC and, and uh, how's it in that space. Now, in light of that, um, and because of that relationship, um, you know, this is, again, as I mentioned, uh, an, uh, a way to adapt what we do today to um, address some of those concerns. And, and the one nice thing about the semi-closed cage, um, even though it's taken us uh, three years to get to a point where we can get it uh, delivered, um, you know, we can deliver these systems quite quickly. Um, so fabrication in Europe, uh, so the prefab of all the, the pipe sections started happening in April and we had it landed in Canada in June. So we can, we can deliver quite quickly. So in terms of land-based operations, that, that wouldn't be um, even close. So we would be looking at, you know, a five to 10 year build on a land-based opportunity. And if we're looking at land-based to um, produce harvest-sized fish, it's probably not going to happen in the locations that we operate now. It's going to be in an area closer to um, the markets as well as an area um, with probably, quite honestly, cheaper land costs um, and a better power infrastructure because that's the one thing that um, land-based oper or operations do require is significant power and significant water. Um, Amy, did is there anything you wanted to add to kind of the, the land-based yeah. end of things? You, you, you touched on all of it. The only thing I would add is um, just the sustainability piece. So farm salmon is, has the lowest carbon footprint and by putting it onto land, you add back in, as, as Brock said, all the, the energy and the natural gas and the fresh water demands. So it makes the salmon a lot less sustainable. So if you're looking, you know, sort of bigger picture and sort of, um, you know, growing populations and diminishing resources, um, it's, there's a significant benefit to keeping the fish in the ocean. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Eric, Brock, Amy, great presentation. Uh, you've come a long way since the uh, early days, probably 25, 30 years ago. Um, only one question I have, what happens to the fish waste and the uneaten the uneaten food, where does, where does that end up going? So that's why it's still considered semi-closed. So um, obviously with the monitoring systems that we're putting in place, um, much like what we have out on the existing farm sites, um, uneaten feed is something that uh, isn't good for business and it isn't good for the environment. So we've, we've um, vastly improved the systems that we have in, in all of our farming uh, operations around kind of the managing of, of feed. Feed is, is still our greatest cost. It's, it's depending on the feed ingredients uh, upwards of 70% of our cost of production. So it's in our, our best interest to manage that appropriately. Um, and uh, we're getting to a point now where the, the feed conversion ratios are um, in and around uh, or less than 1.2 kilos of feed for one kilo of salmon. So there's not a lot of waste, um, wasted feed in that. Now, um, with this semi-closed uh, system, um, there are ports that uh, are open to the outside um, in order to manage some of the hydrodynamics and uh, the waste will be discharged under the existing farm site um, um, that this will be installed in much like it would be in open net pens. And, and that's where a lot of the research now is moving into to uh, improve the systems to actually get to a point where we can um, collect all that waste and filter it out. And that's kind of the research proposals that are being put in place for these types of systems in, in Norway and Scotland. So we're, we're part of the conversation in those because we do see that as the the next evolution of this to um, address that point. Thank you, Councillor Poon, and then Councillor Corbiel. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for choosing local uh, contractors and suppliers and also um, express to you that this is a very meaningful uh, 
development in this area. And also, um, I hope that the project is both successful and meaningful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Corbiel. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Dan asked uh, one of the questions I had. Uh, the other question was uh, in regards to um, the issue with lice. Uh, am I assuming the reason there is no sea lice is because the water intake is uh, considerably uh, deeper than, well, in the old uh, pens, of course, the, the water just came from the surface. And now you're talking 20 some odd meters deep. Is that why there is no sea lice issue? Yeah, precisely. The sea lice um, tend to occupy the upper levels of the, the water column. So that was one of the, the key performance indicators that we had um, wanted to take a look at when, when um, kind of doing our surveillance um, of uh, the farm site this, this will be installed in. So we actually looked uh, for uh, the presence of sea lice at some of these levels and uh, found quite quickly that, you know, we didn't see much for sea lice um, in the water column below 15 meters. So um, that was, you know, the one thing that we wanted to ensure was that this was effective in kind of um, uh, eliminating sea lice challenges within within the cage. Oh, that's great news. Thank you. Any other questions from Council? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much for your presentation um, and for reaching out to set this up. It's always good to understand what's going on and um, this is certainly an important issue for our community. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to unfinished business. Um, the first item is a report from the city clerk for 3123 Third Avenue um, on the building facade. City clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is just a, an update report for Council. As you will recall, um, a couple of months ago, um, we did have a report before you about the uh, facade at 3123 3rd Avenue. Um, so just to inform Council that work is currently being undertaken on the building facade. This is outside the scope of the facade improvement program. Uh, due to uh, rotting and insufficient structural components, the city's building inspector has required the owner to engage an engineer to resolve uh, some of the issues, which he has done. Uh, solutions are almost in place so that work may continue. You'll have noticed that there hasn't been a lot of activity there recently. Uh, they expect to get started again soon under the, um, uh, the guidance of the engineer. Uh, we don't have a completion date for the work, but um, no work stoppages are anticipated and uh, we are hopeful of a positive outcome. That's excellent. Thank you for the update. Are there questions from council? Okay, seeing none, would somebody like to move receipt of this report? So moved. So moved, Madam Mayor. Second. Councillor Corbiel, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And moving on to item two from the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage, we have the Alberni Aquarium and Stewardship Center lease. Willa, welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so on April 14th, Council directed staff to explore the feasibility of the city being in, in a position to split the current Alberni Aquarium leasable area, therefore creating a second leasable space upstairs. On April 27th, staff presented a report to Council confirming that splitting the two, uh, the current space of the two stories was feasible. Since April 27th, uh, the regular council meeting on that date, the Alberta Aquarium Association has confirmed their willingness to retain and lease the entire footprint of unit number seven, so both stories. Uh, staff suggest two options for council's consideration. First would be the Alberta Aquarium Association continues to lease both stories of the current facility at the current lease rate with no subletting permitted, or for council to provide alternate direction to staff. Thank you. Are there questions to start? Councillor Haggard and then Councillor Solda. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I have a question for the Director of Parks and Recreation. 
at the original presentation uh, that the CRAM gave to council, they were suggesting that they were going to sublease the upstairs offices in order to try and generate some funds and decrease the cost of their rent. Well, we weren't uh, supportive of that. And that's when we suggested that you look into the option of subletting both spaces. So do you know why they're requiring the upstairs offices now for themselves? Did they tell you what they're going to be used for or what their intent is? Well, the, Madam Mayor, they currently use a variety of the spaces upstairs. So uh, they're not using the entire space upstairs. Of course, they are using the entire lower story. And so I guess the association has determined that it's viable for them to continue using the both spaces. So as opposed to trying to shift uh, all of the current activities into the one space downstairs, they would like to retain both spaces. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Solda, and then Councillor Corbiel. So just to get it right from the Parks and Rec, so they're going to rent it at the same price, but they're not uh, they're not going to sublet it. And I also would like to know, according to the lease, to the hours of operation, because I'm hearing they're not opening the same time as everybody else, and the days of operation. What are what's the set rates for that place, or not rate, but set hours and days? Uh, so, Madam Mayor, that's correct that the current uh, draft lease does not indicates that subletting is not permitted. Um, so, as as staff had had reported to to council, it's not advisable to explore uh, current tenant subleasing uh, city space. Regarding the specific hours of operation, I haven't received that uh, yet from the Aquarium Association. I would be happy to reach out and confirm what their proposed operating hours are. Madam Mayor, can I continu continue? Okay, so all the other tenants have to open at a certain times and certain days and are they not the, in the same boat? So Madam Mayor, we've been working over the past number of years with uh, the current tenants to get consistent hours of operation days of the week. But at this stage, there is not a set uh, template as you would find at say a shopping mall or that sort of thing that every tenant is required to be open the exact same hours. So we're endeavoring to work with the, the current tenants and the merchants at Harbor Key to run consistent hours. But no, at this stage, there is not a uh, prescribed time that says seven days a week uh, open from X to Z. Okay, Madam Mayor, I just don't want to sign a lease that doesn't have the operation of hours because I understand nobody's going to go at nine o'clock in the morning or 930 in the morning to the aquarium. But we need to have something because once we have everything in writing and signed, sealed and delivered, there's no going back until that lease is opened again. So. Um, I, I would like to have some something. Thank you, Councillor Poon. Um, thank you. Could we perhaps uh, include in the lease the prescribed hours and then give them a certain amount of time to uh, then uh, adhere to those hours? So uh, I'll, I'll chime in and answer, Madam Mayor. Um, of course, it's council's prerogative what, what you wish to, to do with your spaces as, as the landlord. Uh, the city is welcome to prescribe what they wish. Thank you. Councillor Solda, did you have an additional comment on that? I do. And, and just to recognize, I understand summer and winter is different. Um, nobody's going to go there in the winter as much as they are in the summertime because we're full of when we get full of tourists. So I have no problem looking at summer and winter for any of our leases because it's so different in the winter time there. So we need to be concise on what we do and have it for everyone. Thank you. Yes, and, and I'll agree with you on that, that we have been working over the last few years to, um, to build up consistency and to add that language into new leases. So I don't see any reason why we would treat the situation differently. Um, Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a question for the Director of Parks and Recreation and Heritage. Um, we, uh, we gave the Aquarium Society a uh, rent holiday. Uh, I assume that's up. Was it for April, May, June? Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Poon. Has the Aquarium Society 
been able to demonstrate their ability to pay going forward the rent? Uh, Madam Mayor, there, ha there has not been a, a prescribed litmus test as far as what that ability to pay might be. So um, I, would, I would suggest that the closest we've been to that is when uh, Council, you had directed the association to bring forward their business plan and bring forward their budget. So uh, as far as I'm aware, that's, that's the last uh, test I would suggest or confirmation of their ability to, to pay their rent. Thank you. So council, my feelings on this, um, I really wanna see the aquarium be successful. I think it would be a huge shame if we lost that, um, that space in our community. It's provided a lot of value over the last few years. And I think there's a lot more potential for it, um, but I am worried about their ability to pay um, the current lease rate. I also don't think that it's reasonable to um, have this be taxpayer subsidized. Um, or specifically city of Port Alberni taxpayer subsidized. Um, so I have some concerns about their ability to pay, but I'm worried about the precedent it would send to our other leaseholders and just to businesses in general, if we were to allow um, you know, somebody to, to potentially look at subleasing space that we're leasing to them. So I, I'm definitely still um, on the same page where I don't feel that it would be appropriate for allow us to allow subleasing. Um, I don't think there's other support that specifically we can um, offer at this time. I'm concerned about their ability to pay, but um, I think that in my opinion, we give them a chance and, and you know, wish them success and, and hope that they are able to fundraise as much as they're hoping that they're going to be able to. Um, I, I do think we should clarify the hours and I would like that language written into the lease. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I think that can be done and we can give staff direction to do that within, you know, still moving forward as we have laid out here today in the proposed motion. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I echo what you just said. Uh, I, I'm concerned I haven't seen any fundraising unless I've missed it somewhere and suddenly agreeing to the full price on the lease. I'm, I'm hoping they've, they've fallen into some, some money or maybe uh, uh, got a windfall somewhere because uh, we really it, it's nice to have them there it's nice to be able to take your grandchildren down to see that uh, I wish them all the luck in the world but uh, let's hope we're wrong thanks yes thank you any other comments Councillor Solda yeah and I echo everything you've just said too Madam Mayor the um, other thing that I'm I look at is if they don't need the second space the rent can always come down so if they're taking the first space, all, the whole building, that tells you they must have some money somewhere, maybe. Thank you. Councillor Solda, do you want to um, read the motion? And certainly, you know, if you want to add in anything about the hours, you're welcome to. Yes, I uh, just need to find it on my computer here, Madam. Oh, let's just go to the agenda. <laughs> just at the top of page three. Yeah, just let me flip over, sorry. No okay, I'll move that the Council for the City of Port Alberni authorize the Mayor and City Clerk to enter into a lease for Unit 7 at the Alberni Harbor Quay at the, with the Alberni Aquarium Association for a six month term, at July 1st, 2020, at the current monthly rent of 2,140.58 plus taxes and also have the hours of and days of operation included in the lease. Thank you, and I'll second that. Any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing none, all in favor? Carried, any opposed? Okay. Carried, thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Willa. Moving on to staff reports, item one is accounts. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the certification of the Director of Finance dated July 13, 2020 be received and checks numbering 146383 to 146464 inclusive in payments of accounts totaling $2,636,737.46 be approved. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. All in favor? Carried. And back to the Director of Parks, Recreation and Heritage for the digital screen at the Alberni Valley Multiplex. Go Thank ahead. You, Mayor. 
the current audiovisual configuration within the city-owned Alberni Valley multiplex includes solely audio capability. The installation of a digital screen would enhance guest experience within the warehouser rink of the multiplex. Purchasing the screen with reserve funds would ensure zero impact on taxation, and the purchase would also be included in the Parks, Recreation, and Heritage Capital Reserve to cover replacement cost of the unit at the end of its useful life. In addition, the screen would enable new revenue generation streams for the city, and the cost of purchasing the screen would be recuperated before the end of the useful life of the screen. Uh, staff suggest three options for Council's consideration. Number one, Council approve proceeding with a request for proposal process for the purchase and installation of a digital screen at the Alberni Valley Multiplex. Number two, Council not approve proceeding with a request for proposal process. Or number three, Council provide staff with alternate direction. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Corbiel. Yeah, what is the approximate cost of something like this? Uh, Madam Mayor, I expect the cost to be under $200,000, including uh, procurement or purchase of the unit and installation. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Councillor Solda? This was not in our in our um, plan at all, in our budget plan or anything. This is just an added on or, I, cause I don't remember seeing it. Am I right or wrong? Correct, Madam Mayor. This is not currently part of the five-year financial plan. And uh, as, as we'd be looking at amending the financial plan, should this purchase go ahead, uh, wanted to bring it to council's attention first before we approach the RFP process so that we ensure council's on side with the idea before we look to uh, procure the unit. I love the idea. I don't know if it's the right time. That's my problem. Um, we haven't even got our facilities opened yet. And do we see, we don't even know when they will be open. So I'm just kind of curious to know how that's going to work. And if so, if it does get passed today, are we going to sell ads? How is that? What's it going to do for us if we can get more details from you? So Madam Mayor, again, this is the first step in the process. So if council is not interested in moving forward, this is why staff haven't gone uh, to that step yet. We need to first confirm uh, council's keen to move forward with exploring uh, reserves for this type of purchase. Um, and, and as I mentioned in my report that the, the cost would not have impact on taxation and we would develop a plan to recuperate the costs uh, inside of the useful life of the screen, as well as utilize the earth fund or the equipment replacement reserve fund. Um, prior to the end of the useful life of the unit. Thank you, Councillor Paulson. My baby, the multiplex. <laughs> um, I'm totally in favor of option number one here. Now is the time to do it. Um, uh, by the way, the multiplex is open, I think today with uh, prep camp uh, has uh, resumed operations as of today. And I know that um, some Bulldogs operations in August are gonna happen. Um, with facilities of this, um, the multiplex is kind of lagged behind in being current or current with technology. And certainly uh, the big screens, whether it be in uh, GM Place or um, in Duncan, um, add to the experience, but also opens up a revenue stream. Um, as a um, corporate sponsor, uh, whether it be a parks, recreation or bulldogs, um, to have a screen used to support my project or my business in an animated way rather than a uh, verbal way by PA only, um, adds value to, to that side of things. And um, like I say, I. Having worked there for 10 years, it's one thing that we looked at, we've looked at for actually since the multiplex opened to add. And I think it's one thing that, that we're sorely missing in our warehouse or arena right now. Thank you, Councillor Poon. Thank you. I'll echo Councillor Paulson's comments and I'll say it's about time. Thank you. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree. I agree with Councillor Paulson. I, uh, there's there's no good time to spend money, but I'm sure Director Thorpe will come up with a plan to recoup her her uh, her monies. Um, 
and 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 Ron talked touched on a good thing about the advertising value um, to get uh, there's there's a good advertisement in between periods in the game to have your business flashed up on there. I think there's people in town that pay some serious money for that. So uh, I say let's go for it. Thank you. I am struggling a little bit with this coming um, quite out of the blue, um, not being talked about at budget time um, and not really being talked about um, up until this point. It's, it's not um, you know, a strategic initiative that um, aligns with our strategic plan. Certainly, um, generally um, supporting the Bulldogs and, and supporting um, you know, this type of facility improvement um, could very loosely align with our strategic plan. They are certainly values that we um, all share. I think we all want to see um, the Bulldogs be successful. We know um, there's been a lot of challenges this year for them with the ammonia leak um, and, of course, now COVID. Um, that said, I, for me, um, it's difficult to commit to um, just really, you know, out of the blue without any, without this even appearing as a request for um, in, at budget this year to commit to this type of purchase. Um, I would rather see this come forward at budget time um, and be evaluated with everything else. I know over the years, we've also talked a lot about um, naming rights at the um, multiplex and, you know, possibly the opportunity for cor larger corporate sponsorships. And I wonder if this is the type of thing that, um, if that type of sponsorship could be used to purchase this type of equipment. Um, I also recognize that, um, you know, with this type of equipment, we would might be more likely to get a corporate sponsorship. So I understand the request. I'm just having a hard time and I see the value of it and I understand it will be paid back. Um, but even though it's from reserve funds, um, it does impact taxation because we put money into that reserve every year. I think we put $125,000 into that reserve this year. Um, so I, I don't want to see us jumping things to the front of the line just because it's coming from reserves. Um, so I, I'm struggling with this coming, you know, partway through the year and not having heard of it um, before and, and council not discussing it before. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I know um, Councillor Haggard and then um, Councillor Paulson want to speak. I definitely see the value of it. I'm just not sure um, if right now with everything else going on and other projects that we wanted to do that are in our strategic plan um, being put aside because of COVID, if right now is the right time to jump something ahead of everything that is in our strategic plan and spend $200,000. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I think it's a really good request to upgrade our uh, multiplex and I can see the benefits of it, but I do agree with what you're saying. Could we ask Director Thorpe if she could uh, bring this back uh, at budget time for us to consider? Director Thorpe, do you want to just comment on if there is any, um, if there is a reason other than maybe just the challenges that the Bulldogs, the challenging year that the Bulldogs have had, um, which I think is, you know, a legitimate reason to bring this forward, but is there um, an urgency to this for any specific reason or is, ju is it just the sooner the better? Uh, well, Madam Mayor, of course, the, the sooner the better, like any, any opportunity to generate revenue such as this. Uh, just also to touch on naming rights, we actually do have the RFP for naming rights is currently live on BC Bid. Uh, and our website. And so that closes at the end of this month, just so you're aware that that this project could go hand in hand with that. Um, but as far as a specific timeline, uh, no, it's, um, of, of course, we, as, as Councillor Paulson mentioned as well, I mean, anytime you have the opportunity to upgrade facilities is, is good news, but no, there's not one specific instance that would precipitate moving this forward. Thank you very much. I have Councillor Paulson and then Councillor Solda. Um, <clears throat> the reference to the Bulldogs certainly would be a, um, a, a great addition for their program, but uh, it certainly goes beyond the Bulldogs and for other events that may be held there. Now, option one is that we go to request for a proposal. And I would suspect by the time we go through that uh, process, that it would be probably just about budget time. And we would have the request for proposal would come about that time and we can discuss it at, at budget time in the fall. So um, we're, we're a long ways from having that actually 
put up in the building, I would suspect once you go through the RFP process and then, then budget approval. But uh, I still stand, and, uh, we've been talking about this for 20 years in that facility and um, uh, there's no time like the present. Thank you, Councillor Solda. And I would agree how you're feeling, Madam Mayor, is exactly what I'm feeling. Um, the digital board, yes, it's been discussed since day one, basically. And there's always something that came above that um, to have the digital board. The naming rights, and I know the RFP is there, but have we contacted local uh, corporations here in our community to see if there's anybody interested? Because you said it was I believe our Parks and Rec director said it's on some other site. So I'm just kind of curious if we sent some letters out to corporations in our own community. So, uh, but I, I do agree that it should have come up at budget time because this is a $200,000 is a lot of money, especially with what's happening. We don't know. And, um, you know, if we don't, if we keep saying we don't know, we can't move forward. I understand that too. So I'm, fencing it so that's how I feel so madam mayor I'm happy to speak to the um, I mentioned of BC bid so uh, BC bid is the the provincial government's um, or, or the provincial site where all RFPs are posted both for our local municipality as well as municipalities throughout BC so that's the current process it's also posted on portalburney.ca website and we have also reached out to uh, local organizations and companies who may be interested uh, in in bidding on the package. So yes, our local our, our local partners and business community are aware of the naming opportunity at the multiplex. Thank you, Councillor Paulson. Oh, you know me and my passions, but um, um, Director Thorpe, perhaps you could just expand a little bit on um, on that capital reserve. And I don't think a lot of people uh, remember or take into consideration that through each rental, each admission, there is a percentage that goes into the reserve fund. And, um, and to a large extent, this is not taxpayer money. It is actually user fees that, that um, support this fund, or am I wrong there? So Madam Mayor, the current fund, uh, the reserve currently has $2.5 million in it. Um, I would either defer to the director of finance on this question, or I would need to pull up the specifics as far as uh, what percentages of transactions go into uh, to supplementing that fund. Does any, uh, Andrew, do you have that information? Yes, so 10% uh, of the, the fee revenue goes into this specific reserve for capital purchases for the parks and rec uh, function. Thank you. Are you able to um, clarify if additionally we put money in from general revenue contributions into that fund or if it's only from fees? Um, at this time, Madam Mayor, I am not certain if we put any money in the past. Um, I just know that the, the practice now within the reserve is to put that 10% from all fees and, and, and uh, charges from Parks and Rec. Thank you. Councillor Corbeil, did you have a question? Well, I would just like to uh, make a motion that we review this when the RFP for the naming rights has been closed. Thank you. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Solda. Uh, Councillor Corbeil, do you want to speak to that at all? Well, I, I just think uh, this has caught us a little bit out of the blue. And ha as has been said, you know, it's a significant amount of money. And, you know, the, the money comes from the taxpayer, no matter how you, uh, how you frame it. And it is a difficult time. Uh, if there is uh, interest in the naming rights, it might make this decision a, a lot easier. So uh, there does sound like a bit of uh, confusion right now. And I would hope that uh, at the end, of, I believe uh, the director of Parks and Recreation said at the end of the month, it closes and then uh, we could review it again. Thank you. And I would really like to, um agree strongly with that. And, and I think at this point, I can't support um, moving forward with an RFP. And for that, for the reason being that um, we just pulled a whole bunch of things out of our budget um, that, you know, money is money at the end of the day, whether it's in a reserve fund or not. 
Um, we just pulled a lot of our strategic initiatives out of our budget this year because of COVID. So I just don't think it sends the right message to um, now um, make, I know it's not a spur of the moment purchase, but um, it is to council because it's not something that has been brought forward to this council or the last in any formal way. Um, so it does feel like an out of the blue purchase. And I don't think that it, um, I don't think that it makes sense to um, put a $200,000 purchase ahead of strategic initiatives that we um, committed to in a plan and that we just had to pull out of our budget because of COVID. So I would definitely support um, moving forward or seeing where we get to with the RFP that's out currently for naming rights and then reevaluating at that point. Um, I think it could go together well, um, or at least it could um, could be, you know, a, help us get a step closer, but evaluate on um, a playing field that makes a bit more sense and where we can understand um, what the needs and wants of potential sponsors are. Um, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, question for Director Thorpe. What is the timeline like uh, for you to develop an RFP uh, to get it sent out, to get it come to come back and get it to a point where you can actually make a decision. That that's several months, I would think. Am I am I wrong? That's correct, Madam Mayor. The the entire process, of course, dependent on how long the preparation of the package takes, also how how long we wish to post it for. So um, those timelines are fairly fluid, depending from each project to the next. But yes, it's reasonable to to think that it would take a few months to. Uh, to get the package organized and receive responses, to close the, the process then, receive responses and review as well. Thank you. Any other comments before we vote on the motion that's been made? Okay, seeing none. So the motion that's been made, just so that everyone is clear, is to hold off on this until we hear back on the naming rights RFP and then bringing it back for further discussion at that point. It's been moved and seconded, all in favor. Opposed? Carried. Thank you very much. And thank you, Director Thorpe, for the information on this. Um, look forward to talking about it again soon. Thank you. Moving on to item three from the Manager of Planning, we have Development Variance Permit for 4191 Butte Street. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, for Council's consideration today is a Development Variance Permit application for 4191 Butte Street. The applicant is seeking relief from zoning bylaw requirements regarding the minimum side yard setback for the R3 zone. That's a small lot single family residential. And the applicant has requested to vary the minimum side yard setback um, uh, to rectify a construction error. So there's currently an incomplete house on the property and they're looking to bring it into compliance with the zoning bylaw. Specifically, the garage portion of the house was built too close to the east property line and they're seeking to reduce the side yard setback requirement from 1.5 meters to 0.8 meters. And that's a reduction of 0.7 meters. So staff have analyzed this and we've determined that the proposed variance will have a minimal impact on the use of the property and on the use of the surrounding properties. Any potential impact will mainly be limited, limited, <laughs> limited, limited to the neighbor at 4177 Butte Street. Um, this property shares the side yard lot line that's in question for this variance. And while a variance to the side yard setback will increase the crowding of these two buildings, it should be noted that the neighboring house is also encroaching on the same property line. And the applicant has really made an effort to work with the neighbor to mitigate any impacts that might occur through landscaping, et cetera. Uh, despite both houses, encroaching on the side yard setbacks, uh, we've confirmed there's no perceived fire safety risk with this variance. The space between the two houses of the shared lot line meets the fire separation requirements of the BC building code. Uh, additionally, in terms of the surrounding neighborhood, some of the neighboring properties on Butte Street and 12th Avenue also don't meet the minimum side yard setbacks required by the R3 zone. Uh, for these reasons, the planning department support, supports the proposed variance permit for 4191 Butte Street. Um, the Advisory Planning Commission has also reviewed the variance request and has indicated their support. And we conducted public notification for this application as per the Local Government Act. And last night, a letter was received as, as a late item and was added to the agenda today. 
uh, this letter from Mr. Bradley correctly identifies um, that the proposed variance doesn't address an issue of the roof overhang, which projects too far into the side yard. We just didn't catch this in our assessment of the application. So to clarify, the applicant will be applying for a second development variance permit to address this issue with the overhang, which is separate to the variance council is considering here today. So staff will be drafting that report for the second variance in the coming weeks. So before council here today, there's three options to, to consider with regards to this application, which is a variance to the minimum side yard setback requirement. This is to, you can proceed with a development variance permit. You can not proceed with the issuance of the permit or you can provide alternative direction to staff. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Can I just ask if it makes sense to um, do two separate variances or could we not just send this back and then um, wait until the um, variance that does address the um, roof line comes and do it all at once? Absolutely. So there is an approach where we would actually just um, take the report, amend the application, amend the variance and come back to council. We spoke with the applicant this morning at length and based on their timelines and their costs in order with construction, um, they preferred to go ahead for a second variance and have council consider that separately. Okay, questions from council? Councillor Solda. So um, I was gonna ask the similar question. So my question, uh, next question is, if we pass one and we don't pass the other, how does that affect, you know, how do they roll together? And if we didn't pass all this and we see what we're seeing, what happens? So I need to play devil's advocate to understand this. Like, maybe you can clarify that. I, I, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Solda. Um, yes, of course, council has the ability to not approve a variance. Um, this building is already being constructed. If they don't receive the variance, they're out of compliance with the zoning bylaw and they would be subject to enforcement action, which may ultimately result in them having to modify the structure of their building. I think what I'm not understanding is um, if they do receive this variance, they're still out of compliance because of the roof line. Um, so I, I'm not really clear on what difference it makes if we give this this one, give them this one, um, they're still out of compliance. and. Does it make sense for us to be giving one variance, allowing an, one variance, and then bringing forward another um, when we're giving a variance when something else is still out of compliance? It seems it doesn't seem like the right process, and I, I understand you've spoken with the applicant, and they are, um, and and they prefer to do two variances. But um, to me, I wonder how we can really approve one with an outstanding issue. Um, and what does it actually allow them to do if they get a variance today, but they're still out of compliance? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, really, uh, they can receive a variance for this one item and they can still be out of compliance and receive a variance for another item, which brings them into compliance. Um, essentially, this is an item which we didn't catch when we were assessing the application. And ideally, we would have brought the variance forward, which included a variance for both sections of the zoning bylaw. So essentially, what we're trying to do is accommodate the applicant by bringing forward a second variance instead of pulling this one. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but would not both 4191 and 4177 both be out of compliance with the roof lines? Through Madam Mayor and Councillor Washington, that's correct. The other property would also be technically out of compliance. Are they applying for a variance? <laughs> Madam Mayor, no, they're not applying for a variance. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Solda, you had another question. Yeah, uh, and it was to do with the, the roof line too. Um, I think they just make one big roof and then they wouldn't have the rain come down, you know? Like, I'm just having issues on that if one's out of compliance, how is it, how are we doing this? Like what happened? And I think um, um, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Sola, I can address that a little bit. And I did some looking into this as well, right? And had some very lengthy conversations with our building inspector. Um, essentially 
uh, quite some time ago, from what I understand, the city used to not require a building location certificate as part of the building permitting process. So a number of homes along Butte and 12th Avenue are encroaching on their side yard setbacks because we never um, accurately confirmed the location of the actual buildings with regards to the property line. And that's a confirmation by a legal land surveyor. Now, as part of our process, we require that building location certificate after the footings have been poured. So it's concrete in the ground and we can say legally this building is, is not within the setback area and is in compliance with the zoning bylaw. In this case, from what I understand, it was a legitimate error in construction, even though we did request that building location certificate. And now the applicants are requesting to bring their property into compliance by applying for the variance for the side yard setback. And now we have also identified that the overhang is encroaching into the side yard as well, which is a different section of the zoning bylaw. And they're gonna bring forward a second application for that portion. So Madam Mayor, um, so 4191 looks like it has an entrance in between all this where the other 4177 doesn't. Man, I'd hate to be the person to clean up whose snow is it gonna be cleaned up and who's this and you know, I can see that happening. There's gonna be a little, they better love their neighbor. Hopefully they do. <laughs> Councillor Corbeil. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess the, the damage has been done, but how do we prevent this from happening again? I mean, that, that really does look kind of ridiculous when you drive by there. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we could ensure this doesn't happen again? Through Madam Mayor to Councillor Corbeil, uh, you, you've accurately defined it. I believe it comes down to process and us refining our process so we, we prevent the need for applicants to apply for variances in the future. Ideally, we would catch that during the planning and building permit stage, but sometimes it's being missed, as clearly in this case. And our effort would be to prevent that from happening. Thank you very much. Okay, um, are there any other questions from council on this? Okay, I'm going to ask that uh, we first receive the late item of correspondence. Would somebody like to make that motion? So moved. Moved by Councillor Poon. Second, Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Corbeil. Any comments on the correspondence? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. And um, would somebody like to read the motion that is here? And then we can have further conversation if needed. Councillor Poon, would you like to read the motion? Sure, I'll do that. Um, hang on. I'll move that the City Council authorize the issuance of development variance permit number 102 to vary zoning bylaw 4832 as follows. Vary section 5.132 R3 small lot single family residential minimum setbacks side yard east side from 1.5 meter to 0 0.8 meter, a variance of 0.7 meter for development on land legally described as lot one, district lot one, Alberni district plan VIP 81030, PID 026-679-043 and located at 4191 Butte Street. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Seconded by Councillor Haggard, thank you. Any further comments? Okay, um, Council, my comments are that um, I am happy that we have a process in place to ha hopefully not have this happen again, but um, I, I think I concur with the um, planner who said that this will be, you know, there's a, the, the damage is done that was said by someone else and there is minimal impact in this case. So fortunate um, that we're able to, you know, probably make this variation at this point and, and just move forward. So with that, um, all in favor. None opposed, carried. And thank you to um, Brian for the report. Okay, moving forward, item four from the manager of planning, we have the train station request for proposals. Hello, Madam Mayor. Um, I'll speak to that if that's all right. Um, so, Council, you have before you a report from the um, manager of planning regarding the train station RFP, and there's a copy of the RFP in the, in the agenda package. I should point out the RFP document, I think it's 14 pages long. Um, when we add the appendices, it's actually well over 100 pages with all the supporting documents, but we didn't want to put that all into the agenda package. 
So um, I believe last July, council directed that we develop a uh, request for proposal document for sale or lease of the train station. And um, you'll note that the, the R, this RFP document um, speaks only to lease. So if council wants us to um, modify that for sale, we can certainly easily do that. Um, given where we are with COVID and the, the uncertainty around um, investment and business, we're thinking that we might not get the kind of proposals we would have gotten a year ago when council envisioned this project. And so staff recommend that council consider modifying this document further to, um, to create a request for expressions of interest. And uh, expressions of interest would require proponents to be, uh, to commit far less effort and, and uh, finances to this and um, would be the sort of a half step between where we are now and an actual proposal or RFP process. I should also tell you that um, this document reflects input received from the Heritage Commission. Um, Madam Mayor, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, CAO. Could you just clarify first? I know um, you commented that we might not get the quality of application that we, we think we would have a year ago. I just want to clarify that you're meeting the actual written package that people put together and not that we we're expecting to accept any less quality of, of business or proposal. Um, but rather the actual money that people are going to put initially um, into their proposal document. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for that clarification. I, I, if I use the word quality, I, I, I didn't mean to use the word quality. Um, <laughs> we might get as many proposals um, given the current situation as we would otherwise. I don't think Thanks. that anybody who submitted would be any of any less quality than they would have been a year ago. Perfect. Thank you. Council, um, so this is just really up for discussion at this point as to how to move forward. Councillor Haggard and then Councillor Solda. Um, I agree with the CAO. Uh, when I read this, I was very happy that staff did take the time um, to compile this RFP, but um, because of the economic climate right now, I was concerned as well that we're not going to get the um, the response that we had anticipated or had hoped for. Uh, so I agree, let's put on an expression of interest because it does take a lot of staff time to move forward with an RFP and it is costly for uh, an organization to complete. So maybe an expression of interest would be much easier for an organization or a business to, to put forward to the city. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Solda and then Councillor Washington. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I'm definitely, I would like a request for proposal. I'm leaning more for this um, step two, uh, unless they can be incorporated into one, step one and two, because then um, it's, people don't have to put a whole detailed list together and, and go out to the expense. So maybe they, they're both combined together. I know there's people out there that are interested in leasing that building and, um, I don't know. I don't mind an expression of interest, but there's also people who are still interested. Councillor Solda, I just want to clarify because you said you prefer the request for proposal because you don't think that people will be able to put the, the effort, they don't have to put so much work into the proposal. Um, At the moment. That's the expression of interest. Um, okay that requires less. So I just wanna make sure we're speaking um, you know, on the same terms. The expression of interest requires a lot less upfront cost and planning and drawings for the proposal. Okay. It's more of they express an interest and we can just start conversations from there to see if there is something to bring forward. Um, a, a request for proposal is a more formalized process that typically has a lot more cost okay. for the applicant. So I just wanna make sure we're on the same page there. I think that we are. <laughs> sure. Step one, that, which is fine. Um, but you know what? I also would like to see, it says here, it'll be shortlisted, but I would like to see all the proposals that come through. If there's, you know, like interest that comes through, I, I think I would like to see it too, and council too, when I talk about that. Okay, that's fine. Absolutely, thank you. Councillor Washington. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Well, first of all, I'm thrilled that we consulted with the Heritage Commission because that commission's been around for a long time and this is right up their alley. That's that's what they're there for. Uh, second of all, I like the word lease and I'll, and I'll throw out the agreement. And I have to agree with you, an expression of interest takes a lot less staff time. Plus the, they're, you know, the people that are thinking about it and uh, who knows, we can come up with some great ideas. So uh, let's forge ahead with a, a lease and an expression of interest. Thank you. Thank you. 
Council, I'd like to bring another piece of this um, project to the conversation. Um, when we had our original presentation from the um, architect that, that put together the package for us and the, the presentation last year, um, a lot of that conversation was around the utilizing the parking lots um, for a potential multifamily development. And from my perspective, I think this is a difficult time for, um, for new businesses to start up. There's a lot of uncertainty in the small business world right now, um, but the development world seems to be moving along um, in all communities um, as if nothing is going on almost. Um, and I also feel that um, to put our best foot forward, we should decide what we're doing with those lands adjacent, um, the parking lot lands and, you know, the lands right next to there. Um, because I think that if we were to, you know, go through a process, decide we want to subdivide that off, had it, as had been talked about at one point, sell those lands, keep the train station so that the city always owns that heritage building. Um, and we were successful in getting a development proposal for that space um, to put some kind of multifamily development, I think we would then attract a higher end business to lease the train station. So from my perspective, I think that we're maybe going about this in the wrong order. I think that we have to, in order to attract a really quality business, um, we need to make sure that the lands around are properly utilized first. So I would almost prefer to put this on hold um, for six months and explore a process of rezoning and subdividing the land off to see if, I mean, there's a public process to go through there to see if that's something that, um, you know, we would want to move forward with after public input and see if we can um, attract a development, a higher end development to that site. And then once we've got that sorted out, whether it's a yes or a no, then move forward with trying to attract a business to the train station. Councillor Poon. Thank you. I think that if we can uh, use those parking lots and and put some kind of housing development in there, it will be far easier for us to attract uh, a tenant for uh, the train station. And uh, you know, once once we have a population, a sizable population in our uh, uptown and and uh, uptown and surrounding areas, I think that will really help us. Uh, bring in that high quality business. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hager, did you have your hand up? No. Any other comments? Councillor Corbiel. Well, with all due respect, uh, I'm, I'm a little bit leery about waiting for uh, somebody to um, develop the parking lot. We've tried to put out requests for proposals for other lands, arguably uh, nicer lands and uh, we weren't overly successful i would uh, prefer to see uh, us go ahead with the expression of interest and just see what's out there and um you know hopefully down the road we can uh, subdivide and, and sell off some of that property but uh, i don't want to hold my breath councillor solda i would agree with councillor corbeil um i look at it we don't have to get the par parking lots I mean, obviously people are gonna to need to park. We're good. Also when we close off the Harbor Key, where do people park in the parking lots? So, I mean, we can, once we have the expression of interest and in whatever is going in there, we can go back and take a look at the whole picture and say, hey, this is what you get in the, lot, at, in the end. Um, I think we should just go and see what we have out there. I know people have been waiting to, um, move forward on this pro on whatever project they have in mind. So I think we should do it. We can always say no in the end. It's just an expression of interest. Thank you, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That was my question. If you put on an expression of interest, we're not required to accept any of them. Am I correct? Correct, definitely not. So, so we might as well do it and put it out there and see what comes forward. I mean, it's kind of a chicken and an egg kind of thing. So I think we should move forward. Thank you. I think that one thing that I feel very uncomfortable with is what we know is likely the cost of having to fix up the train station to be suitable for a tenant. And if somebody's going to be um, leasing it from us, I think it's likely that we are going to have a significant cost. So, um, you know, when we talk about 
um, possibly spending $200,000 um, on, uh, you know, something for the multiplex that's not in our strategic plan. Then we talk about possibly spending money on this. And, you know, we've had estimates that our ballpark ranges throw it out to us of a million dollars to fix up that building. Then we start to look at what are our strategic initiatives um, and actually moving forward on the key to key path. I think it's important for us to remember that we can't do everything. Um, we can't afford to do everything and we won't be able to do everything. And every item that we put ahead of our strategic plan um, slows down the progress that we're going to make on our strategic plan in our term. So I actually, you know, I'm, I have no issue whatsoever putting out a request or an expression of interest. Um, I know that at one point we did have businesses that made very public that um, they wanted to um, submit something. I know that at least one of those businesses, um, because of the current climate right now, is no longer interested. Um, so I think that we might run into that with other applicants as well. We can always see what we're what we get, um, but I think it's important to remember that um, what we do have that we can actually sell to. Um, if we were able to sell some land, we could finance the improvement through that. And I would rather sell land around it, build a tax base and use that to improve it rather than just um, putting it all on taxpayers. So um, we'll see what we get and maybe we'll get somebody who's, you know, very wealthy and decides to come in and fix up our building. But I think that most of the cost is going to fall on us. Um, that's just my feeling of, you know, knowing how small businesses work. And I just don't think that we're going to get somebody who's going to bear the cost and that's going to fall on the taxpayers. Councillor Paulson. Um, I'm just going to concur with Councillor Corbeil on this expression of interest is simply that uh, we're not obligated to go with any of them. Uh, anybody who does an expression of interest and who is truly sincere and interested will probably come together with an expression of interest that would verge on being a request for proposal. Um, you know, this is another one that uh, we've been talking about for, for years, and I think it could be critical to um, complementing the Harbor Key and in, in, in that area down there. And um, um, lease uh, is the only way to go. We've received that the information loud and clear. Um, I'd like to see what happens. Let's, let's put the expression of interest out there and nothing ventured, nothing gained. And um, let's go from there. Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Could we proceed with uh, going ahead with the expression of interest, but at the same time start working towards uh, putting on an RFP for the parking lot lens as well? Kind of do it concurrently instead of one before the other. Yeah, and I don't think we necessarily have to, like if council wants to move forward with an expression of interest and see what we get, I don't think there's any harm in that. Um, we might wanna have a separate conversation about the parking lot lands. Um, I just am worried about the cost to um, that, like I, I really feel like if we are going to put out an expression of interest, we need to be committed to fixing up that building. It's not fair to waste the time of small business people um, who are going to express an interest and, and put time and effort into trying to put something together for this space. So I just want to, I guess, be comfortable knowing that this is something that financially council is going to be comfortable committing to if we get the right applicant. And for me personally, um, with the other initiatives that we already have committed to in our budget, um, I don't think that we're going to be ready to spend that money if an applicant comes forward. So I would rather go about it the other way, um, but there's no harm in seeing what we get. Well, I guess I shouldn't say there's no harm. The harm is that we potentially get a, you know, a development or a, a not a development, but um, a positive business wanting to go in there. And then we turn them away because we don't want to spend the money to upgrade the building. So I think that we have to take it seriously if we're going to um, ask people to spend their time putting together proposals. We need to be in a position where we're going to be willing to spend the money to do the work that needs to be done to that building and recognize that it could be significant. Uh, Councillor Poon. Thank you. I agree that uh, with your approach and I think that if we if we can sell off a few pieces of land, we can, you know, we have a bit more confidence there and we'll have some money to play with and we won't be 
uh, you know, it, it'll be more palatable to uh, spend some money fixing up that building. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Washington, I think you want to speak. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm just thinking if we're going to put out the, uh, the EOI, uh, maybe have the other land available in case somebody wants to do something big time rather than have the property and then say, okay, this is the only space you get because uh, I'm going to sell this and this and this and this. If we throw it out as a full meal deal and see what happens. I think you might, you might, we might be surprised. Thank you. Well, that's what council had originally directed was to put the entire parcel out for sale or lease and to allow a combination of things. So to allow somebody to come in and want to, you know, build a multifamily residential development on the parking lot, but at the same time to allow a smaller operation to come in and, um, you know, bid on a lease for the building. So um, that is what we had originally directed. Um, this is what's been brought back to us. And I actually agree with staff that I think that, um, they are very different and I think they should be handled separately. Um, my preference is just that we handle them at different times. Um, but I, I, I think that we're more likely to, um, we're more likely to get what we want if we handle them separately. So that's my feeling, but we can direct whatever we want. That's just not the um, way the RFP is currently written. Councillor Corbiel. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question for the CAO. If a, um, if a restaurant, for example, has seating less than 50 people, does it require the same amount of seismic upgrading as a, a larger restaurant? Is there not different levels of this so-called assembly uh, designation? I'm, I'm just not, um, I'm not, not, able, not able to answer that, Councillor, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, I should, I will say the RFP document references um, improving the building to a high standard. And, and um, that's certainly up to council and the city, what standard we set, um, as long as it's not below a minimum standard. But, um, but I'm not aware of any occupant load that, that uh, would drive um, seismic um, preparation. Certainly occupant load would drive fire protection, sprinklers and that kind of thing. But I'm not in a position to answer that question. And of course, it's the BC building code that uh, we have to uh, meet, right? That's correct. Okay, so would anybody like to make a motion on this regarding the expression of interest or anything else? Councillor Paulson. Um, I'd like to move option number three that we alter the uh, request for a proposal um, document to be converted to a a request for expressions of interest. That is okay, any further conversation? Seeing none, all, oh, Councillor Corbiel. I'd just like to add uh, what uh, Councillor Haggard had said about uh, trying to uh, as well look at um, subdividing and selling off uh, the, the piece of property next to the train station. Council, could I propose that we um, put the train station, the lands, the parking lot lands as an item and unfinished business to discuss at our next council meeting? I think there is value in, in having the conversation separately and the two processes certainly could, you know, run concurrently at the same time. Uh, but I think we want to make sure we have a full discussion about that topic as well. So um, CAO, if you could add that as an item to our next council meeting, that would be great. Um, yeah. And for now, um, on the motion, seeing no other comments, um, on motion to put out an expression for interest, all in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Carried, thank you. Okay, and item five from the Economic Development Manager, the 2020 Facade Improvement Program. Good afternoon, Council. Um, the request is um, that uh, some additional funding uh, be put into the fa facade improvement program uh, this year. I'll just give you a bit of background. Uh, this is the fifth year of the program. Uh, in the four years previous, we've completed 40 uh, projects uh, with a total spend uh, from the city of 187,000. 
uh, a, a spend of, uh, or an investment of, from Community Futures of 219,000. And over that time, we um, have leveraged about 1.2 million in investments on the part of uh, building owners and uh, uh, business owners. Council did approve uh, 50,000 uh, for the program this year. Uh, we received 13 applications, uh, totaling 104,000. We've approved eight of them uh, for our 50,000. Um, so we're asking uh, that uh, council consider approving another uh, 54,000 uh, for the remaining five applications, which would leverage another 180,000 uh, in investment. Um, and we're asking that, or I'm asking, uh, that the dollars would come from the 140,000 that council previously redirected uh, from the economic development budget into uh, the support of the uh, small business uh, community to uh, transit uh, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, when council did approve that, um, you remarked that uh, you hoped uh, that the initiatives that uh, I'd put in front of council that totaled uh, that 140,000 would be more of a a guideline than a, group, a blueprint. Um, we've had several communications with the small business community over the last uh, few months with uh, three over the last uh, five weeks. Um, and it would suggest, those communications would suggest uh, that the supports that are in place uh, and the initiatives that are in place are sufficient uh, for uh, the community. Um, I would um, point out that uh, that would leave uh, $86,000 um, in the redirected funds if uh, the entire uh, $54,000 uh, was utilized. Um, the funding is not paid out uh, until the completion of the facade improvement program. So that's uh, my pitch and I'm open to your questions. Thank you very much, Councillor Haggard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The purpose of the Small Business COVID-19 Recovery Fund was for economic development and stimulation and to support our small business community. So it, this falls right in line with, with the intent of the fund. So I would like to make that motion if that's okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Is there a seconder? I'll second that. Seconded by Councillor Kuhn. And I've got comments from Councillor Solda. And then I think Councillor Paulson had his hand up. Okay. My comment is I, I think it's great. Um, what has happened in the past has been a vast, vast improvement for our community. And I totally support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Councillor Corbeil. Just a, a question to uh, the manager of economic development. There were uh, 13 applicants and eight, this was in the first go round and eight were accepted. What kind of criteria did you use or is it the first come first serve or how does that work? Um, we uh, take a look at um, what, uh, where each of the uh, applicants are um, with respect to um, a number of uh, aspects of their relationship with uh, the city. So um, is their business license uh, paid uh, for and up to date? Are their taxes paid for and up to date? Are there any outstanding uh, work orders uh, that exist? Uh, are the uh, utility fees uh, paid for and up to date? Um, and uh, eight of uh, the applicants uh, uh, tech, uh, checked 
of uh, all of the uh, boxes that we use to adjudicate. Um, the others were given a note um, saying that uh, these, uh, there were uh, concerns, um, small concerns uh, that we have with respect to uh, the uh, criteria and uh, we would make sure that, uh, for example, if it was an outstanding uh, utilities payment, uh, that that was taken care of uh, before uh, we went ahead and approved. Thank you very much. Any other comments? Well, could I just follow up then? Uh, would it maybe make sense then that we have a, a new round of applicants? Um, there may be other businesses that uh, weren't around or, or did weren't in a position to apply last time. Uh, that would be at uh, council's discretion. Um, we, um, my my view, my personal view is uh, that uh, the community is aware of the program because it is the fifth year. Uh, a few of the uh, businesses contacted us uh, before council adopted the budget um, with, uh, with the funding in it. Um, and uh, we did uh, advertise uh, the program uh, on Peak Radio in the Alberni Valley News on our Facebook pages. It was put out in a chamber uh, newsletter, Community Futures, uh, let their clients know. So I'm um, reasonably uh, confident that uh, the businesses that were interested in the uh, program um, applied. Uh, and I guess I would also have a small concern uh, that if we were to go ahead and um, advertise the program a, again, um, that I might be coming back to you uh, saying, sorry, it's not 54,000 that um, uh, we'd like for this year's program, but it's um, 54 plus. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Okay, well, I just want to speak in support of this um, and in support of the program generally. I think um, this program has been a huge success. Um, and uh, I spoke about it on a call that um, Pat and I were on um, a few days ago with other mayors and chairs and um, Minister Robinson and a couple of the other mayors reached out to me afterward for information on the program because they were um, they thought it was a great idea and a great initiative. And so I think it's, some, it's a really great program that um, our community has been able to put forward, um, obviously with huge support from Community Futures over the years. So very thankful to Community Futures for all that they've done to help us. And I think this is a great way to um, just further support business recovery and make sure that we're able to help as many businesses get into this program as possible this year. So um, thanks Pat for bringing this forward. On the motion, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much. And item six from the Director of Finance, the finance, uh, finance reporting update. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so this is just a quick update to provide council a current status of our financial reporting. Uh, we anticipated having the financial report completed by the end of June, but we missed that target. And we're, we're uh, still within the, uh, the time frame to meet the reporting requirements. We anticipate getting our financial draft statements today uh, with the, the statements coming to council on the July 27th uh, council meeting. So just a, just a quick update and uh, happy to take any questions if council has. Thank you. Are there questions from councillors? Seeing none, okay. Um, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to move receipt of this update? I'll move, Madam Mayor. Thank you, is there a seconder? Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon, all in favor? Carried, thank you very much for the update. And next, also from the Director of Finance, BC Transit Revenue Allocation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. 
uh, what we have is an option to um, provide some financial uh, leverage with our reserve funds that we have in place. Uh, so we've been impacted with the transit revenues that we've seen uh, over the last few months uh, through uh, late March and into uh, May. Uh, we did not collect revenues through our, our transit uh, uh, service at, at, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the bus. And at this time, uh, we, we started that, that collection back in June on, on the 1st of June. With that, we, we have seen a reduction in the amount of, of revenue, obviously with the, the, the schools closed and, and, the, and the physical distancing that's being uh, uh, practiced right now, we're not seeing the ridership that we normally see. So with this, we do have an option to use our reserves. Uh, Approximately five years ago, this reserve was set up to, to support any, any uh, impacts to the financial plan for our transit service or annual operating agreement, uh, any changes to our lease fees for, for, the, for the equipment that is in there, or an option to expand the service should council desire that. Um, with this, we do have some funds that we could allocate and uh, staff is recommending that we provide 75% uh, of the reserve funds as, as, a, uh, as available for the financial plan this year, should we need to use it. Um, later on this year, we'll have an ability to, uh, to dial in uh, what funding we need so that we don't have a, a shock to our, our revenues uh, for the, the following year. And we are uh, in, uh, we are with uh, UBCM as far as lobbying the senior levels of government to look for support for our transit systems across BC. Uh, so we're looking for uh, additional funding as, as the UBCM group uh, to support uh, the transit services that are provided in the communities across BC. So we're not sure at this time what the full impact is going to be, but uh, we do have these reserves that we can use to provide that, uh, that uh, mitigation of any, any uh, revenue loss that we are, are anticipating this year. So. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from council? Councillor Corbeil. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a quick question to the uh, manager of finance. How are these, um, these funds accrued? Uh, Madam Mayor, these funds are accrued uh, annually through the the uh, the budgeting process, and any any funding that uh, is is uh, over and above what is required uh, will be going to these funds. So the uh, province provides their share, and we provide our share, and then it goes into this funding. So uh, historically, uh, there wasn't this in place, and there was some shocks uh, to uh, to the uh, the financial plan because of of increases in, in contracts or increases in leases uh, of equipment, so. Thank you. It sounds like this is a um, great reserve to be using for this purpose, which is, you know, completely unexpected um, change in our revenues. Um, okay, so with that, um, Councillor Solda, would you like to read the motion that we have there? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor. I'll move that the council support a provisional plan to use 75% of the shared operating reserve and local transit fund balances to fund our annual operating costs with BC Transit for 2020 to 21. Second, Madam Mayor. Thank you. All in favor? Carried. Thank you very much, Andrew. And moving on to item eight from the acting director of engineering award of tender RFT 010-20 for 16th Avenue water supply main replacement. And I think we have Mr. Watson popping up here. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry about that. The uh, some technical glitch occurred because I was waiting too long, apparently. <laughs> um, so, for, I have a report uh, for Council's consideration this afternoon with respect to award of uh, tender for water main construction project uh, on 16th Avenue, um, and the recommendation is that Council award the project to the low bidder, Napa Industries 2006, uh, for a tendered price of five hundred sixty-five thousand seven hundred six dollars. There were uh, seven bidders for uh, for this uh, piece of work, of which uh, Napa Industries was a low bidder. Um, 
there is adequate funding available to uh, to proceed on this tender um, with the funds being uh, being sourced from the water capital reserve fund um, and they are set aside for this use in the 2020 um, five-year financial plan document uh, and i'd be pleased to answer any questions council has about the project thank you any questions from council councillor paulson and then councillor corbiel uh, Councilor Haggard, um, I'm going to ask a question here with regards to something that's near and dear to your heart, which is social procurement. Um, I'm just wondering in our um, processes, uh, moving towards social procurement or that being a component, um, and not necessarily just around this particular bid, but um, I guess social procurement is really we're going to give you the contract, but also what can you do for us? And um, if that's a consideration of, of these tenders and also, I guess maybe just a, a question and it's probably a little bit broad, but uh, what's the opportunity for uh, local employment uh, with uh, this company or the companies that bid? Thank you. I think um, we could certainly get, I think Andrew is our point person on the social procurement process that's going on. If he wants to comment on that, our current purchasing policy does not have, um, I think, I know we do have some allocation if it's within $5,000 or something like that, we're able to go for a local bidder, um, even if it's not the low bid, but um, not a discrepancy of this much. Um, Andrew, are you available to answer the question on social procurement and, and where that process is at at this point? Yeah, certainly, Madam Mayor. Um, so we are currently working with, um, um, I forget the organization's name, but they're the island uh, group that, that provides the support for the social procurement uh, program. And uh, we're trying to meet up and, 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 and come to some, um, some formalization of something that we could put into our, 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 our uh, procurement process. At this time, we don't have that. Um, we, we do have a meeting, I believe, next week with the organization to uh, start to discuss how we can include this. Uh, and even in the in the meantime, we could possibly have this in, in uh, procurements as we move forward. But at this time, we don't have that in place. Um, so we do anticipate getting this to uh, council in the fall uh, with uh, some plan to uh, include it in our purchasing policies and our, in our procurement moving forward. Thank you, Andrew. And, and thanks, Ron, for asking that question. I think um, social procurement is more important now than ever as we start to look at our projects as, um, you know, potential economic um, activity for recovery from COVID and recovery for from our area. We certainly want to make sure now more than ever that, um, you know, as much of the work that is being done here is being done by local people and having as much benefit to our local community as possible. Um, Ken, was there anything that you wanted to add there? Uh, no, Madam Mayor, only available to answer any questions Council has about the project and why it's being undertaken. Great. Thank you. Um, Councillor Corbiel. Well, I think my question was answered that uh, there was a local contractor that was just a little over 5% uh, who bid on this. And, you know, at some point, I guess it would be worth sitting down and, and trying to understand the, you know, the value of local contractors and local people and the the monies they put back into the local economy versus uh, uh, contractors that uh, don't live in town and, and have employees that don't live in town. But that's for another day, I guess. Thank you. Any other comments on this? Okay, Councillor Corbeil, would you like to read the motion? Thank you, Madam Mayor. I move that the council award the contract for the 16th Avenue water supply main replacement to Napit Industries 2006 Limited for the tender price of $565,706, including all applicable taxes with funding from Water Capital Reserve Fund. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried, thank you. And item nine from the Acting Director of Engineering, award a vehicle tender for um, a backhoe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Likewise, another report with respect to award of a tender, in this case, um, 
for a backhoe loader. Um, we tendered this, this work and received uh, four bids um, with respect to uh, provision of, of this unit. Uh, and we were recommending that uh, Council uh, award this uh, vehicle tender to the Inland Group for provision of a 2019 case uh, 580 backhoe uh, in the amount of $131,492.57. Um, that, that is the low bid, Madam Mayor. Um, but it is for a 2019 unit, which I should point out to Council that, that uh, the city did uh, specify a current year model in our tender. Uh, but because of COVID-19 issues, uh, two of the bidders did uh, proffer an alternative of a 2019 unit um, because of the fact that they would have had, in their view, uh, quite long delivery times uh, for the delivery of a 2020 unit. Um, so staff have considered the, those 2019 proposals as an alternative which we are allowed to consider. Um, and in this case, we think it is an alternative that we should, that we should consider taking, um, taking advantage of because the 2019 unit will be, um, will be approximately $8,000 less costly and will be available uh, within a month instead of uh, within 120 to 150 days. So, so staff is recommending that we take advantage of that alternative bid uh, to buy a 2019 unit. Uh, and I'd be pleased to answer any other questions council has about this. A proposed purchase, Madam Mayor. Thank you. I have Councillor Washington and then Councillor Poon. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just a question for Mr. Watson. Um, I know it's the 2019, but I think that's we still would have a full warranty on that. Yes, absolutely. The warranty would be the same um, as as on a 2020 unit. Okay. Second question: um, the one we're sending or going in for re um, trade in. Um, is a John Deere, do we have a, any multitude of parts left over for that thing that will be virtually useless to us when we get a case? Um, I do not know the answer to that to that uh, question, Madam Mayor, but I could, I could find out. Um, my anticipation was that we would not keep a large stock of parts on hand, that we would be able to purchase those relatively quickly from the, uh, from the um, vendors. So I don't anticipate we would have a lot of parts on that, but I don't know specifically how many. Okay. And last question. I guess this day and age, they're virtually the same machine when it gets in, when you when your operator gets inside your operator that's been running a John Deere for however many years now he's going to get into a case. Um, should 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 be no problem for an expert. I would concur that the the unit will be you know fully operational. And we did review uh, with our operations staff uh, the selections of the different units that were offered, and they were very very happy with uh, with the case uh, unit. So there was no issues in their regard to moving towards it, that brand. Thank you, Councillor Cook. Thank you. My question was regarding warranty and it's already been addressed. Thank you. Wonderful, any other questions? Seeing none, Councillor Poon, would you like to read that motion? Yes, I'll read that motion. I'll move that Council for City of Port Alberni award vehicle tender RFT 002-20 backhoe loader to Inland Group for provision of a 2019 Case 580 Super N backhoe loader in the amount of $131,492.57 with funding from ERRF. Thank you. Thank you, is there a seconder? Second by Councillor Washington. Uh, seeing no more comments, all in favor? Carried, thank you. And on to item 10 from the City Clerk, uh, Dog Mountain Brewing permanent change to liquor license. City Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Dog Mountain Brewing, uh, located at 3141 Third Avenue, is applying to the Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch for a permanent change to their hours of liquor service. The proposed hours uh, would be 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Sunday. Uh, this is not a significant change from the hours they, they currently have. The LCRB requests that Council consider the application and provide the branch with a resolution and comments on the impact of noise on nearby residents, the impact on the community if the application is approved, a view, the views of the residents and a description of the methods used to gather the views, 
and a recommendation including whether or not the application be approved and the reasons on which they are based. In response to the notice that was provided in the local newspaper, posted on the city's website and mailed to all residents and businesses within a 75 meter radius, we did receive uh, one comment or one letter that is attached to your report. Um, this particular uh, individual suggested that all patron parking enter and exit onto Third Avenue to keep noise and nuisances to a minimum for residents. A copy of that submission was forwarded to, um, to Dog Mountain just for their information. And they did respond today saying that they have taken steps to mitigate some of those concerns. They also um, advised that they don't intend to be open until 11 p.m. seven days a week, that that is um, going to be for events and special occasions only. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Are there any questions on this? Councillor Poon. Thank you. I'd like to speak in support of this and uh, just want to express that I'm very pleased to see that even during these difficult and uncertain times, we have businesses in our community that are asking to open later and longer hours. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any other comments? Councillor Solda. Yeah, I'm just going to move that the Council for the City of Port Alberni support the application for a permanent change to the liquor license for Dog Mountain Brewing located at 314 13rd Avenue to extend their hours of liquor service from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Monday through Sunday and forward the report from the City Court dated July 7, 2020 to the Liquor and Cannabis Regulations Branch LCBRB. Second that. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Haggard. Any further comments? Seeing none, all in favor. Carried. Thank you. We have no bylaws, no correspondence for action, no proclamations. So on to correspondence for information. City Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, today we received a letter from the UBCM advising that uh, the, they are distributing the Community Works Fund payment for the fiscal year 2020-2021 in the amount of $790,580.78. The District of Squamish uh, provides a copy of their letter to Minister Mike Farnworth uh, regarding uh, recommendations in regard to improving public safety. BC Active Transportation Infrastructure Grants for 2020 2020-2021 have been announced uh, and a link to those projects uh, which will be receiving grants has been provided. Association of Vancouver Island Coastal Communities advises that a virtual AGM will be held on Tuesday, September 22nd uh, in conjunction with the UBCM. Nominations for the executive has been reopened until July 22nd. Aaron Brevik has submitted an email expressing concern regarding city property next to 5119 Athol Street. And uh, lastly is a copy of a letter from the mayor to Western Forest Products, thanking them for providing their property tax payment uh, in full prior to the July 2nd due date. Thank you. Any items that councillors would like to highlight? Councillor Solda. Yeah, first of all, thank you to Western Forest Products. And second is Aaron Brevik. Um, maybe the CAO could explain what's happening with the property next door to um, Aaron Brevik's uh, property that he leases. Absolutely, CAO. Madam Mayor, um, Council will recall that uh, the Arrowview Hotel used to stand on the, the lot adjacent to the building that we're talking about. Um, the city was uh, was um, was poised to take that building down to demolish the Arrowview and uh, would have at considerable expense to to the city. Um, we uh, council directed that we give the new owner an opportunity to demolish the building and uh, and be supportive of that new owner and, and we've done both and um, that owner has um, done I think a a good job of demolishing the building. It's taken longer than the city would have liked, but we've avoided city costs to this point. And um, the demolition has been done safely that we can see, as far as we can see. And uh, a, a significant amount of material has been salvaged out of that building, which uh, would not have happened if we had if we had undertaken that work ourselves. So um, all in all, it looks like to be a, a successful project. 
Um, if you've been by that site, and I've been by there a lot, um, there's still a fair bit of debris left on the property. Um, it looks like all the salvage has been picked over and it's just a clean up now. Um, and then it remains to be made safe. The building owner, property owner tells us that his intention is to finish that work and to put a wooden railing around around the uh, excavation so it'll be safe to the public and that he intends to redevelop. Our last interaction with um, the owner of the Airview was in early June when we reminded him that he, he had promised to be done by the start of June. And uh, he said he, he was he encountered a couple of problems, but it was still his intention to finish the job. Um, here we are in second week in July, that's still not done. We reached out to the owner last week um, to see what his plan was and next steps. And we, we haven't heard back from him yet on that. Um, the letter of complaint references some of that demolition material that is um, laying on city land. The city owns two alley right of ways um, adjacent to the Arrowview property. Those are undeveloped alleys. And some of the construction debris is on at least one of those alleys. And um, that seems to be the point of contention at this point. So our, our direction um, to date has been on this project has to been to give the building owner time and space to complete the, the demolition and clean up himself. If council would like us to continue that course, we will. If you'd like us to be more aggressive on that property on that project, then we'll take a more aggressive stance. Thank you. Any further comments on that issue? Okay. Um, and I just wanted to comment on that, that um, in the social media post that went around on this issue, it did reference, um, you know, offer to purchase the land. Um, and I, I just want to comment for clarity that we um, would not receive those letters in a public meeting or any specific offers to purchase the land. So um, I know that is being talked about publicly, but um, we have a process to go through if that were to be explored. Any other items that councillors would like to highlight? Okay, I just wanted to clarify on the letter to Western um, that the, I'm not sure if everyone is aware, but the provincial government did actually extend the um, tax filing or the tax payment deadline to I think September 30th for industrial and other taxpayers. Um, of course, that put a lot of hardship on many communities like ours who um, do rely on a, a large amount of heavy industry tax payments being received. And our cash flows, of course, um, uh, you know, expect us to receive those payments by July 2nd, not September 30th. So um, Western did pay their taxes in full. Um, uh, prior to the regular tax filing date, even though they could have waited till September 30th. So that was the reasoning for this letter being sent and just appreciating um, that because it would have been difficult for us if none of our taxpayers, um, if they all took advantage of the um, extension to that date, which they have full right to do. So um, with that, would somebody like to move receipt of the correspondence for information? I'll move Madam, so move Madam Mayor. Second. Councillor Corbeil, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried, thank you. And there's no report from in camera today. Council reports are there. Any questions or comments or items people would like to highlight from their reports? Councillor Solda. I don't have a report, but I do have a public report. I wanna just say, I know it's scary times in Port Alberni. And I've had people come up to me and say, there's people that are from province to province. And, um, but they were here before COVID happened and they stayed here with their families. So what happened is there's people in the community, they, they looked at our community and thought, what a great place to move to. So they were, these people were looking at houses. In the meantime, the neighbors are taking pictures of their license plates, say, and it turned people off coming in, moving to this community. So I think people need to understand, sometimes we have Alberta license plates and we're allowed to move from community to community, province to province, that they're here for a bigger picture and they might be wanting to move here. So please go out and talk to these people. Don't, I understand we're all scared of the COVID, but we need to have more communication and there's more reasons why people are in this community. I don't want to see people frightened off. And these people here that were from Alberta looked at it, I went, oh, maybe not in Port Alberni. So get out there and talk to people. They're here for other reasons too, not just because and so I just wanted to bring that up, Madam Mayor. 
Thank you. And We're I a think great a community. Good, exactly. And it's, it's a good point that um, we don't know people's circumstances. There's a lot of legitimate reasons to be traveling around still. And we want to make sure that COVID is being taken um, seriously and that um, we are not having, you know, unnecessary travel. Um, certainly that we're following the provincial regulations. And, and as we know, there are no regulations that um, that you know disallow interprovincial travel. Um, I know there's been a lot of concern about the United States license plates that people are seeing, and um, I would encourage people to follow proper process if they um, do see license plates and they are concerned about people traveling. Um, what we have been told is that the first um, step is to phone the RCMP non-emergency line and report that, um, and they will be able to take it from there. So. Um, it's not our um, it's not our issue to go out and solve on our own, um, but it's to follow up process and, and we certainly encourage people to report things that they're seeing that they feel are not um, following the rules that are out there for all of us to follow. Any other items for council reports to highlight? Councillor Corbeil. Uh, just a couple things. First, uh, I would uh, certainly like to thank the uh, Alberni Valley Community Forest Board for the uh, $2 million that they've uh, given the city in a dividend. Um, they worked hard for that. And, um, and I believe as well, they have a little bit of money set aside to get them through what's, what's likely gonna be a, a tough uh, year or two. Uh, secondly, uh, I was involved in a conversation with Mosaic. Um, it was uh, nice to vent for a while. Um, I'm still extremely frustrated that uh, most of the wood that comes out of the valley came from uh, TFL 44 and uh, two divisions, Sprout Lake and Cameron Division. But uh, there was, um, you know, there was a glimmer of hope. Uh, one thing, uh, they have got everybody back to work, um, though uh, not too, too many of them are local people. Uh, there was some discussion about access to the back country, and I believe there is slowly going to be some movement on that, so we could uh, hope to see that uh, something comes out of that. And uh, lastly, uh, Mosaic is running the McTush uh, campground. I think they charge $25 a night or something, and apparently there's quite a bit of room there. So uh, just to let people know if they're looking for a campground to uh, go to the Mosaic website and you can book uh, campsites at McTush online. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. Would somebody like to move receipt of council reports? Moved by Councillor Solda. Second. Seconded by Councillor Poon. All in favor? Carried, thank you. Uh, no new business today on our agenda and any questions received, City Clerk? Uh, just one, Madam Mayor, a question from uh, Mr. Neil Anderson, and this is in regards to the Multiplex digital screen. He states, how can councillors be willing to spend $200,000 from a short discussion at a council meeting? Are taxpayers not entitled to input? Thank you for that. So, um, of course, we did put it off and this gives the opportunity um, for input. But um, again, I, I think that, um, you know, a part of the conversation today was bringing that forward at budget. And I think that's a, a really good point to be made that um, when things come forward and, and decisions are asked for um, just with one turnaround of a council meeting, it doesn't give the public that opportunity. When things come forward as a part of our regular budget process, we have multiple meetings of engagement where people can give feedback and, and provide input. So um, thanks, Mr. Anderson, for that question. I think that is um, an excellent point. So um, looking forward to discussing that, that issue more. And with that, somebody like to move adjournment. Moved by Councillor Paulson, seconded by Councillor Solda. All in favor? Carried, thank you.